Hi friends, Apostle Price here. This year, 2013, we are celebrating 35 years of ever-increasing faith television. We are still walking by faith. During this year, we will air some of our most popular classic series from years gone by. Remember, you have made it happen for the past 35 years. I appreciate your loyalty. Stay with us and enjoy my classic teachings. Get involved. Visit faithdome.org for more details. From Inglewood, California, ever increasing faith. Evidence, does your life show enough evidence? With pastor and teacher evidence. Frederick K. Price. Evidence, could they put you away? Evidence, evidence, do you need enough evidence? Evidence, evidence, what does your life Welcome to Ever Increasing Faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Well, praise God for another day and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the Word of the living God. Oh, He's good, He's good, He's good. I'm so glad that I know that He lives, that He's not dead, that He's still working, and I thank God that He's working in and through me right now. Praise the Lord. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, and we want to continue our study on the subject, Fundamentals of Faith or How Faith Works. How Faith Works. We've been sharing some basic principles with you, and I think that they are apropos that we might learn how to operate in the principles of faith. That is the secret of it all. That is the secret of moving the hand of God. That is the secret of living the overcoming and victorious life. That is the secret of winning and not losing, is to understand how to operate in the principles of faith. But if you don't know the basic principles, then you'll have a difficult time being successful. Just like if you don't know some rudimentary English, you'll have a difficult time in writing a letter. If you don't know some basic mathematics, you're going to have a difficult time in uh, operating in the money market. So there are some basics that we need to understand in every area of life, and most importantly in this area concerning the things of God. Now in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now remember we pointed out the fact that the word now there is a conjunction and actually ties the... 10th chapter together with the 11th chapter, and that the word now in the Greek is not describing the time of faith, and yet by the same token, if we were to drop the word now and just deal with the statement faith is, that would let us know when faith is. Because you see, you could say faith was, which would be yesterday, or past tense. You could say faith will be, which would be tomorrow, or future tense. So when it says faith is, we're still in line in saying that faith is a present tense reality. In other words, if it's not now, it's not faith. Faith is always now. It's always present tense. And that's why you have to say it with your mouth. That's why you have to confess it. And that's why I've always said, you see, I believe that all my needs are met. That's my faith talking. I say it that way, and that's what causes it to come to pass. Do you follow what I'm saying? Many times there may be something I desire or there may be something that I need to deal with financially. Let's just use finances for an instant that I need to deal with. But I, right at that moment, I may not have the actual money to pay the situation, see? But I believe that I have it. And faith is my evidence, so I have to confess it now. I can't wait till I get it to confess that I have it because then it would be too late and it wouldn't be faith. Because once I got it in my hand, then I'd know it and wouldn't have to believe it. Follow what I'm saying? So faith is always now. Now we pointed out that faith is the substance or the tangibility, the materiality of things, T-H-I-N-G-S, of things that we hope for, which lets us know then that hope has no substance by itself, but if I add my faith to hope, I give it substance, like adding sugar to lemonade will give it sweetness. Then we found out that faith is the evidence or the proof of things that are not seen. We pointed out that this is not talking about visual perception, but rather sensory perception as opposed to spiritual perception. So we could read the verse that faith is the evidence or proof of things that are not perceived by your senses, which means then that you can never appeal to your senses to find out where you are with God. Now we gave you a synonym for the word faith. And we pointed out from Romans, the 10th chapter, the fact that it says, What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. That's Romans 10, 8. 
What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And of course, it's called the word of faith. Why? Because it produces faith. And then Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we find out God's divine order, and that is that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Therefore, it is called the word of faith. Why? Because it produces faith in the hearts of the hearers. We could then read Hebrews 11:1 1 like this. We could say, now the word of God is the substance, the tangibility, the materiality of things that I hope for. The word of God is the evidence or the proof of things which are not perceived by my senses. Therefore, in order to walk successfully with God, I have to learn how to walk outside the realm of the senses as it relates to the promises of God, as it relates to the covenant of God. I cannot permit myself the luxury of operating by my senses because when I do, I will miss the best that God has to offer because the things of God are in the spirit world. And it is my faith that makes the transfer from the spirit world into the physical world. Now, now, until they arrive in the physical world, faith becomes my evidence of them. Since God's word is synonymous with faith, then God's word becomes my evidence of those things that my senses cannot yet see until they arrive. Once they get there, then I don't need evidence for that any longer. I now have that. Follow what I'm saying? So then faith for a given situation is temporary. Once that situation is fulfilled and manifested physically to my senses, then I don't need any more faith for that any longer. Everybody understand that? All right. Now, remember we pointed out from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, the fact that it said we walk by faith and not by sight. And so we gave you another uh, paraphrase, and we said we could say it like this, for we walk by the word and not by the senses. We walk by the word and not by the senses. Now, in our last lesson together, we left off with this statement, and that is that there is what I refer to as the duality of existence. That means that things exist in two forms. They exist, first of all, in a spirit form, in a form that is outside the realm of my physical senses. They exist out there in the world where God is. You see, Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 24, talking to the woman at Syker's well in Samaria, that God is a spirit. Therefore, God lives in a spirit world, a world that is not tangible like this sense world that we see, but it is just as real. In fact, as I pointed out to you before, it's more real. Why is it more real? Because the Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So if God, who is a spirit, created all material things, that would mean that God would have to be in existence before he could create the material things. Therefore, he must be more real than the things which he created because the things which he created are dependent upon him and he is not dependent upon the things. Okay? You got that? All right. So I want to give you a very graphic and vivid biblical example of the duality of existence. You see, that's why you can say with confidence when you understand what the covenant is saying and when you understand your rights in Christ, that's why you can say with such boldness. Now, sometimes people will misunderstand you and they'll think you're being fanatical. They'll think you're being crazy when you say that. Sometimes they'll even think you're being braggadocious about it when in fact all you're doing is complying with God's divine order and you are confessing based on God's word. And that's why you can say, I believe that all my needs are met. I believe that I have this desire or that desire or whatever it might be. See, you're saying that by faith. It may not yet be a physical fact. You may not yet have it in your little hot hand, but you believe that you do. And so faith becomes your evidence of that thing. But you have to be convinced that that thing is real and that it exists out there in the spirit world or else you'll never be able to maintain your faith to get that thing. Now, I want to show you a very vivid picture and a very vivid scriptural example of the duality of existence so that you can understand and know that things are actually real out there in that spirit world. Now, for instance, I, I mentioned this in our last lesson, but I think it bears repetition, and that is that right now while, we're, while you're listening to me here in this main auditorium and while others are looking on, watching and hearing and listening to this program, there are radio waves that are actually flowing through this building right now. FM radio waves, AM radio waves, VHF, television pictures, UHF, television pictures. They are moving through this building right now. 
They're in operation in here right now. But we can't in the natural hear them or see the pictures. Why? Because they're on another frequency. They're on another wavelength. In other words, they're in another realm. And we cannot see into that realm unless we have the proper apparatus. A radio, which is really a receiver. Or a television set, which is really a receiver. Now, unless we tune in to the VHF frequency, we will not pick up any VHF transmission. Unless we tune in to the FM frequency, we will not pick up any FM transmissions, even though they're coursing through the room right now. But they're in another realm. All right, God is in another realm. He's in the spirit realm. And what you have to do is to tune in. And the way that you tune in is with your faith. And the way that you know what's being played or transmitted or what's on the station is by looking in the TV guide. When you want to find out what's on channel 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 88 or 99 or whatever it is, you don't sit there and speculate on it and say, well, now I wonder what's playing. Well, maybe they're playing thus and so. No, you immediately go and get a TV guide which tells you what's being transmitted. Well, dear Christian friend, I want you to know that this Bible is God's TV guide and it's letting you know what's being played every single day on God's 24-hour-a-day station. It's one billion trillion kilowatts, whatever, megahertz or whatever they use in the industry. Man, it's the most powerful transmitter ever transmitting. And it's being transmitted all the time. And all you've got to do is get the TV guide, God's Word, and find out what's being played, what's being transmitted. Praise God, sometime divine healing's on every day there. All i got to do is switch to divine healing. If I need material things, I switch to the material channel. If I need spiritual things, I switch to the material channel. Whatever I need, it's all in the TV guide. But you can see if you don't know how to read the TV guide, and if you don't know what's being played, what's being played you'll never be able to take advantage of what's being transmitted. So you need to be convinced that things exist in another realm. See, I believe that everything I say with my mouth is in existence in that spirit world for me. Now, the reason I believe it is because God told me that in his word. Follow what I'm saying? And that's why I'm bold to say it. And I'm not really concerned what anybody thinks about it. And, and people that say, well, he's strange. Or oh, watch that Fred Price. He, that's a strange dude. He talks about stuff that he doesn't have. But see, they are missing the mark. They don't realize that I'm speaking by faith, that faith is my evidence. See? And I'm not being crazy. I said it about that car I have, and I got it. I said it about money that I have. I got it. I said it about my house. I got it. I said it about my divine help. I got it. I said it about wisdom, wisdom to be able to pastor a church like this, wisdom to be able to deal with all of the varied backgrounds and varied experience patterns and all of your likes and your dislikes? Have you ever stopped to think that that is a monumental task to be able to deal with so many different people and be able to minister to them? And I have asked for the wisdom of God. I confess that I have God's wisdom every day. I confess that Jesus is my wisdom. I confess that the greater one indwells me and that when any situation arises, I'll be able to handle it. Oh, my, my, my flesh many times cringes at certain situations that I have to do. I don't like to do it. My flesh says, no, no, let's don't do that. We don't want to ever be hurt. Let's don't do that. But you see, I have to rise above my flesh. I have to rise above that which is personal and get into that which is going to edify the body of Christ. See what I mean? And so I have asked for the wisdom of God. Lord, teach me how to minister to your people. Teach me how to govern them. Teach me how to lead them. Teach me how to teach them so that they can grow up in you and be rich in your things. See what I mean? And see, all of these things, it's a total lifestyle. But I'm saying it by faith. I'm saying it by faith. Many times when I begin to do things, I'm shaking in my boots. My natural man is shaking. My knees are knocking. You just don't see it because I don't really know how am I going to say this? How am I going to do this? How will I deal with the thing? What are the people going to think? How are they going to react? See, but I have to rise above that thing and realize that, hey, listen, if Jesus was here and doing this, speaking to the sheep, he wouldn't be concerned about what he felt personally. He wouldn't be concerned about how it was going to look for him. He would be concerned about the people. He'd be concerned about the body. And so by faith, you see, I confess and I say certain things. I confess and I say certain things, not because I actually have them yet, but because God's Word, God's Word says that they're mine, and because all I have to do is let the Word be my evidence of the thing not seen, and then it'll come to pass. All right, now, let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Kings. 2 Kings, the sixth chapter. We're talking now about the duality of existence. We need to be convinced that things exist in another world, in another realm. See, I'm convinced, hallelujah, I am convinced that my desires and my needs are both already there in God's world, in God's realm. And it's my faith that brings them out of that invisible realm into the visible realm. Follow what I'm saying? I'm absolutely convinced on it. Nobody could ever talk me out of it. 
Because, see, I've walked in it, and I have proved it for myself. I know it works. That's why I'm so hipped up to try to give it to you and share it with you so you can get in on it. Hallelujah. So we can all, praise God, every one of us ought. If you want to, all of us will drive up in Silver Seville. Praise the Lord. In fact, when the folks in the community walk by, they say, oh, gee, I thought that was a church. I didn't know that was a new car dealership. <laughs> hey, hey, right? Sure. I mean, if your Rolls Royce is your thing or Volkswagen rabbits or whatever, we have a section for rabbits, praise God. And we'll have another sec section for mongooses or whatever they call them. <laughs> praise the Lord. Follow what I'm saying? I want you to get it. I want you to experience the joy and the victory that there is in walking by God's Word. Because it's real. Man, it's changed my life. It took me from poverty to wealth, from sickness to health. Took me from below and put me above. And the devil would like to tear it all down just like he wants to tear it down in your life. But I'm personally not going to let him do it in mine, and I trust that you won't let him do it in yours. Huh? Kick him in the head with the word of God. Hallelujah. All right, now here in 2 Kings, there's a story. I'm not going to read all of it because it's quite lengthy, but I'll give you a, a synopsis, an epitomized version, if you would, a nutshell, capsule view of this story. In this particular time, at this particular time, in the history of the nation of Israel, Israel was at war with the nation of Syria. Hmm, things haven't changed too much, have they? <laughs> they were at war with Syria. Now, the Syrian general would send down his troops to ambush the Israel or Israelites. Now, what happened was that there was a prophet in the land in Israel named Elisha. And he had the word of knowledge and working of miracles and discerning of spirits in operation in his ministry. And the Holy Spirit would reveal to Elisha the battle plans and the strategy of the king of Syria. And Elisha would relay the information through the hotline to the general of the Israeli armies. And then what would happen is that the children of Israel would go out and ambush the ambush. Now finally that happened so many times that the king of Syria said, we must have a fink in the ranks. We must have somebody giving away our military secrets. There must be a break in our communication setup. And one of the men said, oh no, general, that's not the problem, old king. No, that's not, that, that's not it. What it is is that there's a prophet over there in Israel, and man, he knows everything, even what's going on in your bedchamber. Well, he really didn't know everything. He only had a word of knowledge as the Spirit will. He only knew some things as the Spirit revealed it to him. And so the king said, well, where is he? They said, oh, he's holed up over there in the city of Dothan in Samaria. And the king said, well, get the troops together. We're going over and lay siege to the city and do away with this break in our communication setup. Well, they came and they laid siege to the city and surrounded it. Well, Elisha had a servant named Gehazi. And Gehazi went out one morning to draw water at the well. And after drawing the water at the well, he decided to go up onto the wall of the city. And after, after he arrived at the top of the wall, his eyeballs almost fell out of their sockets. He dropped the water buckets, and as he looked out over the valley, the whole valley, the surrounding hillside, the city, every road, every gate was blocked by Syrian troops as far as the eye could see. And he dropped his water buckets and started back to the house and said, My master, my master, how shall we do? How shall we do? The army of the Syrians, the army of the Syrians, we're surrounded. There's no way out. There's no way we can get out. We're doomed. We're lost. Every road is blocked. Every gate is blocked. What are we going to do? And the prophet finally grabbed him and said, Man, sit down here and have another cup of coffee and two more donuts. Get yourself together. <laughs> well, after he had had his third cup of coffee and uh, two, uh, two cubes of sugar and a little cream and his third donut, the prophet said, all right, now run it through again. Take it from the top slowly. What is the problem? He said, my master, I went out this morning as usual to draw water at the well. After I drew the water at the well, I decided that I would go up onto the parapet of the city, up on the wall, and just look over the valley and see how the crops were doing, see what was going on. But when I arrived at the top of the wall and I looked out over the valley, all I could see were Syrian troops. They have every road blocked. <laughs> every hill is covered with them. And the gates are blocked. I mean, there's no way out. We're going to die. We're going to die. There's just no way out. And the prophet said, come and show me. So they went out to the wall. He climbed up on the wall. And when he arrived at the top of the wall, the servant said, see, 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 look, see. And the prophet said, oh. <laughs> and the servant said, oh. He <laughs> said, man, we're about to lose our lives. The city is surrounded. Every road is blocked. Every gate is stopped up. And you're talking about, oh, is that all you can say? All right, watch this. Verse 16, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16. 
And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And the servant looked at the prophet with skepticism written across his face, took a step back from him, looked out over the wall, and began to count. 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000, 70,000, 80,000, 90,000, 100,000 picked Syrian troops. He looked at the prophet and said, one, two. <laughs> one hundred thousand, and there's two of us, and this lunatic says that there are more with us than are with them. He took another step back from the prophet and said, surely he must be sunstroke. Something is wrong with this man's head. Can he see? We're going to die. All right, now watch it. Watch it. It may sound amusing, but I'm, I'm shooting for a point. And here it is. Here's the punchline. Look at verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. Have you ever in your life heard of such a dumb, nonsensical, useless prayer? Now, the young man, his eyes were already open. That's the thing that scared him silly, is what he saw with his eyes open. And here's the prophet praying this ridiculous prayer, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. Well, his eyes were already open. Wait a minute. Wait just one moment. There is more to you than that sitting in that chair or that bench right now. There's more to you than that flesh and blood body. Remember that you are a spirit. You have a soul and you live inside of a physical body. You are made like God in that you are a spirit being. You have a soul, and you live inside of a physical body. The physical body has eyes, but so does the real you, the spirit man on the inside. He has eyes. What the prophet was praying was not that the young man's physical eyes be open. They already were. That was obvious. That's what scared him, is what he saw with his eyes open. The prophet was talking about the eyes of the inner man, the real you, the real person on the inside. He was saying, let the, the eyes of that real man be open so that he can see. Now watch what happened. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. That's why Elisha said, fear not. Hey, baby, don't worry about a thing. Everything is well in hand. He knew the scriptural injunction. He knew the biblical principle that the angels of the Lord encamp around and about them that reverence him. He knew the scriptural biblical injunction that says that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High and abideth under the shadow of the Almighty, that a thousand can fall at their side and ten thousand at their right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. The prophet understood that principle. The young man didn't. And so the prophet was speaking with the eye of faith. He said, don't worry about it. Hey, listen, don't worry. There are more with us than are with them. And sure enough, when the young man's eyes were open, what did he see? What did he see? He saw horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. Now, here is what I want you to see. Here's the truth. This is what I want you to get. If you don't get anything else out of this message, I want you to get this. Don't you realize that in order for the young man's eyes to be opened, the eyes of his spirit, to see into the spirit world, the angels and the horses and chariots of fire, don't you realize that the angels and the horses and chariots of fire had to already be in existence? 
because if they were not all ready there, even though his eyes were opened, he would not have been able to see what wasn't there. The opening of his eyes did not create the horses and chariots of fire. The opening of his eyes merely permitted him to see what was already there. How many of you understand that? The duality of existence. You see, it was all, the angels are already there, and the angels are already here. I don't know whether you know it or not, but there are angels standing around this room right now. Oh, I don't know whether you know it. See, I believe that. See, I believe that according to the Word. See, the Bible says that angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who are heirs of salvation. I'm an heir. I am an heir and a joint heir with Christ. In fact, I have an angel that stands right at my side. It travels with me wherever I go. I have my own personal ministering spirit. Now, some who have seen these angels recognize how large they are. They're about nine feet tall tall. They're real. Well, I don't believe that. You ain't never going to see one then. You just disqualified yourself. You said you don't believe it. See, you've got to believe it. By faith, I know that God, by his angels, are encamped around and about me. See, no man can set upon me or you to hurt or harm us when we know that. But you see, by faith, you have to believe it, and by faith, you have to confess it. That's what makes it work. Now, the thing I want you to understand now, all of these things that the young man saw were already there. See, when his eyes were open, that didn't create the angels. That didn't make angels suddenly appear. That didn't make horses and chariots suddenly come into being. They were already there. They would have had to have been there. Or else when his eyes were open, he would have saw nothing. So that means they were there all the time. Even though his senses, these two things here, even though they couldn't see it, they were still there. He had, Elisha was convinced that they were there. And praise God, God's word says that they're there. They're not only with me, they're not only with you, but they're with you also, dear friend. Trust God's word and walk according to his word and you'll never have another scared day as long as you live. Some folks talking about, man, you better not go down there to that part of town, man. Them folks that hit you in the head down there. Ooh, man, I ain't never going down. Man, that's a bad part of town. Ooh, man, them folks down there, they might, they might do anything to you. What are they going to do? Now, now, let me ask you this question. See, if you really believe that. Now, 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 if you were walking down the street, okay, let's say you're walking down the street, and on your left-hand side was Godzilla. <laughs> on your right was King Kong, and flying over your head was Rodan. Now, who would you be afraid of? <laughs> what dark street would you be afraid to go down? Huh? Uh, you walk down, anybody bother you? Say, you'd say to sick them, Kong, get them, Kong. <laughs> well, I want you to know that you have somebody with you that's bigger than King Kong will ever be. You've got God Almighty on your side. <laughs> He's with you. But now you're going to have to believe that, see? You're going to have to believe that. You're going to have to confess that it's true and then act like it's true. See, I used to be afraid of flying on airplanes. And I have flown almost 400,000 miles all over this world preaching God's Word. Never had a scared day after the first day I flew on an airplane. When I got a hold of fear and found out what it was, I found out the angels are with me. I found out it, nothing can happen to me while I'm on the plane. Oh, I mean, the plane might blow up. It might, all the engines might fall off, the pilot, co-pilot, and the, and the radio man, and, and the, the stewardess. Everybody may drop dead. All the passengers fall out in a dead faint. Nothing can happen to me to hurt or harm me. You know why? I believe the angels are on board that plane. In fact, every time I get ready to fly, I say, all right, angels, today is the day. I'm commissioning you now and sending you forth to the airport. You check the plane out, check the pilot out, check the weather conditions out, see that everything's working right. I'll be there in a little while. Glory to God. That's right. And when I get on board, I'm not worried. You know why? I'm looking with the eye of faith, and I know that around that plane are horses and chariots of fire. Praise God. Do you get it? But it operates by faith. And when you operate that way, you'll never have another scared day. Won't be, you won't be afraid of anything. Scared of nothing. No way. Because God is your source of supply in every area. All right. So you have to realize that things exist in two forms. 
and everything your hearts desire that is good, that is consistent with a godly life, and that is covered under this covenant contract that we have signed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, every bit of it is yours and it belongs to you. But I tell you what, you'll never have it. You'll never receive the benefits of it until you begin to confess it with your mouth and believe it in your heart and walk by faith and not by sight. Walk by the word instead of by your senses. You follow what I'm saying? See, many times my body tells me you're sick. You're sick. You're sick. You ought to stay home. You ought to call those folks up so that, so that they, you know, they'll get somebody else to take your place. I said, how can I call them up and tell them I'm not coming when there's nothing wrong with me? Yeah, but how do you feel? See, if the devil can ever get you into the realm of the senses and keep you operating in the senses, he'll demoralize you, he'll destroy you, and he'll defeat you. But if you keep that dude in the arena of faith, you put the word of God on him, and you'll stomp him, you'll turn him every way but loose in the name of Jesus. All right, now, let's move on, and let's look now at Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. Mark's Gospel chapter 11. We're talking about fundamentals of faith or how faith works. Now I'm getting ready to show you how to actually put it in to operation. I've given you the, the basics that are involved, the basic ingredients that are involved in it. I've given you an illustration from the Bible about the existence of things in another realm besides this realm that we see with our physical eyes. Now I'm going to give you the actual mechanics of how to put your faith into operation. And I'm here to tell you that it works. I'm here to tell you that this whole ministry is a result of that. I'm here to tell you that this television ministry is a result of that. I began to confess that. I began to thank God for it. Oh, a year ago, I guess maybe or more, I began to say it every day in my prayer time. I began to say, Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the television ministry. I want to thank you for the nationwide television ministry. We are started. We've started. And, and all by these principles. See, God wants his word out. And whatever works to get the word out, brother, that's what we'll use. If it comes to using St. Bernard dogs, man, use them. Whatever will get the word to the people so the people can be free. Jesus told us and gave us the great commission, go and set the captives free. Hallelujah. Set them free. And the only way they can be free is through the word. Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And you know what? The truth's not always sweet. It's not always nice as far as having to receive it right at that moment, but it'll make you free. And I believe in being free. I'm not going to be in bondage myself. I walked in that bag for years and years and years. I'm a free man now, and I'm going to stay free. I'm going to stay free. Why? Because Jesus has made me free, and he wants others free. And this ministry has set many people free. That's why you're here. That's why you are here. Oh, I know there are always some who are here to scoff. There are always some tight wad penny pinchers that don't want you to get anything. Some little that are operating in jealousy. But what can they stop? Nothing. I, my heart goes out to them. Like Jesus said from the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They really don't realize. They'd be in joy. Because you see, I like to see people prosper. I like to see them a success because you know what that does for me? It holds out the possibility that I can succeed. Wouldn't that be terrible to see everybody else succeeding and you wouldn't be able to succeed? Everybody else winning and you losing every game? But boy, when you see somebody else winning, it's say, praise God, that's hope. Man, I know if they can win, I can win because God's no respecter of persons. You see what I mean? And so these principles work. All right, now let's read here. Mark chapter 11, verse 24. If you ever wanted to know what the prayer of faith was or is, this, this are it. <laughs> this is it, okay? Listen. Therefore I say unto you, what things, there are those T-H-I-N-G-S's again. Therefore I say, now I want to pause right there because I want to make it very clear who's talking here. You know, a lot of times people, they miss it and they say, well, you know what Pastor Price said? No, no. Oh, dear friend, never make that mistake. The person you want to quote is God. Now, if Pastor Price says what God says, and the only way you're going to know that is to be able to measure what Pastor Price says with the Word of God. Then you can say it. But don't just quote what a man says, me or anybody else. Because we're fallible, we're human, we could, we could blow it, we could miss it, but God can't. So always, first of all, quote what God says, okay? So I, I want to be sure that you understand that this is not Fred Price. Now I want you to scrutinize that 24th verse very carefully, and I want you to notice that Fred Price's name does not appear, at least not in my Bible. 
You have Fred Price's name in your Bible? It's not, it's not in your Bible? Is it in your Bible? You mean Fred Price, the name Fred Price doesn't appear in your Bible? Sure doesn't. Isn't that something? That's right, it doesn't. I didn't say this, so I want you to get it. You, you will either accept this or reject it on the merit that it is the Word of God, not the Word of the preacher. Okay? Notice what he says. Therefore, I say. This is Jesus talking. This is not the pastor. It's not the evangelist. It's not the Sunday school teacher. It's not the elder. Not the deacon. Not the choir director. Not the choir member. Not the TV technicians. Not the radio control man. Not the usher. Not the evangelist. Not the bishop. Not the monsignor. Not the cardinal. It's not the pope. It's not the president. It's not the congressman. It's not the senator. It is Jesus Christ, the head of the church. This is the Son of God talking. You will either accept it or reject it on the merit that it is the word of the living God. I want you to understand that. See, I want you to be sure to get that down into your spiritual craw, as it were, so that you will know that you know that you know that you know that this is not the preacher talking. This is Jesus Christ speaking. All right, let's read. Therefore I say, this is Jesus speaking, unto you, what things soever, what things soever ye desire. What? Desire? Why, Brother Price? You're not supposed to have any desires. What all, you're only supposed to desire what God wants for you. Why, you're not supposed to expect to have what you want. What did the man say? He said, what thing soever, who desires? Ye means you. You means ye, because that's the meaning of ye is you, and you means ye, and ye means we. Okay? All right? He said, what thing soever, who desires? I said, who? What thing soever ye desire. He didn't say, what thing soever God desires for you. He said, what thing soever who? You desire. So whose desires are in question here? Our desires. You mean, Brother Price, that God wants me to have my desires? Well, sure. Provided... Your desires are consistent with God's Word and consistent with a godly life. Well, I didn't know I could. I thought I was just always supposed to say the will of the Lord be done. The will of the Lord? What, does, what did the Lord have to do with the, the kind of shoes you have on this morning? Did the Lord tell you to wear those shoes? He sure didn't tell me to wear mine. I looked in my closet. And I decided that I'd wear blue today. And I wouldn't look too good, at least in my thinking, a brown shoe wouldn't look too good with a blue suit. So instead of picking the brown shoes, I picked out the blue shoes. And you know what? The Lord didn't stop me. I mean, he's not going to wear the shoes. I'm going to wear them. God doesn't care what color shoes you wear. God doesn't care what color dress you have on. Did the Lord tell you, did the Lord tell you to wear that color today? God tell you to wear that color jacket? No. You, he said, what things forever you desire. See, we've been tricked into believing we're just supposed to sit around and say, well, the will of the Lord be whatever the Lord wants. No. God's not going to drive it. You are. God really doesn't care what you drive. Bicycle. Built for two. <laughs> He's not going to ride on it. You are. He's not going to pedal it. You are. God doesn't care what you ride in. He doesn't care what kind of house you live. You can live in a teepee. <laughs> you can live in a teepee. God doesn't care. Three bedrooms? Five bedrooms? No bedrooms. <laughs> God doesn't care what kind of bed you sleep in. Soft mattress? Medium? Hard or firm? Twin? Double? Queen or king? He's not going to sleep in it. You are. He said, what things soever you desire. 
He doesn't care what you eat. Hot dogs? <laughs> Hamburgers? El taco? <laughs> Burrito? <laughs> Filet mignon? It's not going to be his taste buds. Your taste buds are going to taste it. See, we, 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 we've been led into believing that God didn't want you to make any choices in life. He does want you to have your desire. Well, that's what the man says. I, I mean, I, you know, I, maybe it doesn't mean that. Let's read it again. Let's see what Jesus said. He said, therefore, I say unto you, what things wherever ye desire. Hmm, what things wherever ye desire. Well, Brother Price, I just can't accept that. That just couldn't mean that. Because after all, suppose I were to desire the wrong thing. Do you mean God is going to let me have that anyway? Whoa, 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 ho, ho, hold it. Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 just a minute, just a minute. Are you a Christian? Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I was born again on the 18th day of May, 1900. And 39, at 7.15 and a half a.m., the power of God hit me in the top of my head, went out the bottoms of my feet. I looked at my hands, and my hands looked new. I looked at my feet, and they did too. Well, then what you're telling me is that you're saved. Oh, yes, saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. You are. You, 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 you say, oh, yes, definitely. In other words, you, mean, you believe your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Oh, yes, in capital letters. <laughs> well, well, then what you're telling me then is that you're a Christian. Oh, yes, definitely. You've been born again. Oh, yes. You're a child of God. Yes, absolutely. Well, well let me ask you something then. You say you've been born again. Oh, yes. You're a child of God. Yes. You're safe. Yes. Well, let me ask you this question. Why would you want something that was unholy, unclean, not consistent with God's plan and purpose? Oh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. No, no. I would never want anything that God wouldn't be pleased with. Then what you worrying about then, all you have to do is pass up all the bad stuff and just keep on with the good stuff. That's all. You've been copping out with this stuff about, well, you know, you know, it might be bad for me. Hey, let me tell you something. If you go down to the pet store and you want to buy a pet for your child, let it say a cat. You know, a nice little soft, cuddly kitten for your child. And you get down to the pet store and, dear friend, you walk in and you are gazing over the animals that are available. And you can't tell the difference between a plain old pussycat and a tiger, I would suggest you buy yourself a dog because you're <laughs> gonna be in some trouble. You get what I said? That yes. so you've been talking about and copping out with, well, I suppose I don't know whether it'll be good for me. Now, you ain't got no business with it. You don't have any business. If you can't tell the difference between a cat and a tiger, get a goldfish. Because you may end up losing your life. You may get a tiger and think you got a stray cat. And when that dude grows up, he gonna get tired of frisky buffet. He gonna want you. Huh? See, we've been copping out with that. I said, well, I'm asking, you know, suppose I, you know, huh? He said, well, I suppose I don't know whether it's good or bad. Well, that's a sure sign. You ain't got no business with it. Case in point, let us suppose that I set up here on the table two large glasses, fill them up with white liquid. To the natural eye, it looks like grade A, pasteurized, homogenized milk. And I say to you, dear friend, I want you to come and drink from my table. I have here two glasses. I want you to know that one of them is filled up with the highest quality, triple A, pasteurized, super duper homogenized milk. The other glass, however, carries in it the highest grade arsenic. Please come and drink from my table. <laughs> and I didn't tell you which is which. I'd like to ask 
this question, which one would you drink from? <laughs> Neither one. Which one, which one would you drink from? Neither one? Neither one? Right. You, you mean you're going to spurn my hospitality? Yeah. <laughs> which one would you drink from? Which one would you drink from? Neither one. Why not? Why, why wouldn't you drink from either one of them? I'd drink from either one of them. You just go ahead and drink, huh? Trust me. <laughs> would you drink from either one of them? No. Why not? Because I didn't tell you which one it was. In other words, then, you're not going to deliberately take poison, are you? Something that's going to kill you. Well, have you ever thought that maybe God is giving you credit for having enough sense to know whether that thing you desire is going to kill you or make you a better person? Has it ever occurred to you that maybe God has given you credit for having enough sins? Credit for loving him enough? Credit for desiring to walk in his word enough that you would not deliberately desire something unholy, unclean, hurtful, or harmful, knowing that the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God dwells in you, and that you would not deliberately put something in you that would destroy you? Maybe God's given you credit for having that much sense? And that's why he can afford to say, what thing soever you desire. Hmm? See, we've been losing out on God's blessings by talking about, well, it may not be good. And then somebody prayed, bless their heart. They prayed for a Rolls Royce and got a Volkswagen. And then they said, well, that was the will of God. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. That wasn't the will of God. You just settled for less than the best, that's all. You settled for what the devil gave you, not what God gave you. Listen, if you ever ask God for something and you didn't get what you asked for, you did not get your prayer answered. Oh, yes, Brother Price. The Lord just knew that it would be better for me. It would keep me more humble if I drove a Volkswagen than a Rolls Royce. All right, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's suppose you go down to the, to the meat market, maybe one of these places where they're, you know, they're still cut and pack and wrap, wrap your meat for you. You can pick out what you want. And you go down there and you tell a man, listen, I want, uh, I want four porterhouse steaks. And, uh, oh, I guess about six pork chops and uh, a leg of lamb and uh, one standing rib roast. You put your order in. He comes back and he gives you a great big package full of salami. <laughs> salami! How many of you would accept it? You would have a fit. You would have a natural fit. Why, I didn't order this salami. No, you'd stand up for your rights. You'd say, I didn't order salami. I ordered porterhouse steaks. I ordered a standing rib roast, and that's what I want, and that's what I'm going to pay for. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Do you think God has less intelligence than you do? I mean, he has to be at least as equally smart as you, right? <laughs> at, least, at least equally. I mean, he has to be a, a, at least as intelligent as you are. And you have enough sense to know that if you order porterhouse steak, lamb chops, pork chops, and a standing rib roll, and the man brings you a package full of salami that you did not get your request, you didn't get your order. Well, I'm here to tell you that if you prayed for a Rolls Royce in line with God's word and you ended up getting a Volkswagen, you didn't get your prayer answered. Same principle. I get everything that I pray for. Every single thing that I pray for, I get it. You know why? Because I operate in line with what he told me. Now, if he didn't want me to have it, then why did he say to me, what things soever you desire if he didn't want you to have your desires? Huh? Did you get that? How many of you understood what I just said? Why would Jesus say, what things soever ye desire if he didn't want ye to have your desires? All right, now let's, let me show you something from the Bible. Turn to the 37th Psalm, Psalm number 37. I'll show you that that principle not only operated or operates under the new covenant, but it operated under the old covenant. God has always wanted us to have our desires. But now understand that the desires must be 
consistent with God's Word. All right, now watch. 37th Psalm and the fourth verse. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of whose heart? heart. Whose heart? heart? He shall give thee the desires of whose heart? But now see, notice the priority here. He, says the, he said the first thing, he didn't say the first thing, the Lord will give you the desires of your heart, and then after that, after that, you delight yourself in the Lord. No, no. The first thing is, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of whose heart? Well, you see, if you delight yourself in the Lord, and you know what? There's only one way you can delight yourself in the Lord. The way you delight yourself in the Lord is by delighting yourself in his word. Because God and His Word are one. You cannot separate God from His Word any more than we can separate you from your Word. I mean, if your Word is no good, that means you are no good. If I can't count on your Word, that means I can't count on you. Because you and your Word are one. God and His Word are one. If I can't count on His Word, I can't count on God. God is only as good as His Word. I've never seen God. Have you? Oh, I don't mean in one of your psychedelic dreams now, or, you know, you know, back then over there on the other side when you weren't quite walking with the Lord, you know. Some folks go, I saw the Lord. <laughs> no, you were on a trip, honey. <laughs> no, 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 not that kind of thing. But you've never seen God. Neither have I. Well, how do you know that God will do what he said he'll do? The only way you'll know that is by taking him at his what? Word by doing what his word says and then giving him an opportunity to fulfill his word. If he does everything that he said he'll do in his word, then you know what you can say about God? You can count on God. You can count on his word. Isn't that right? So, he said, delight thyself also in the Lord. The only way you can delight yourself in the Lord, dear friend, is by delighting yourself in his word. All right, now turn to John's Gospel, chapter 15. We're talking about how faith works. And we're dealing with some fundamental principles here. And we're talking now about how to put the mechanics into operation. We've, we found out about the essential ingredients. Now we're finding out how to operate in them. And Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty four, what things soever ye desire. And what I'm doing now is to establish, or I'm attempting to establish for you what the Bible says concerning our desires. Because as I said, I used to hear the fact that well, you're not supposed to desire anything. All you're supposed to do is say the Lord's will be done, whatever the Lord wills, whatever God wants. But we never really stopped to think about it. I mean, that's not going to do us any good what God wants as such. I mean, I'm the one that has to drive the car. I'm the one that has to eat the food. I'm the one that has to taste it. I'm the one that has to wear the clothes, not God. So he's interested in my desires. See what I mean? Be because he knows that if I do what his word, if I will do what his word says, I would never desire anything that's inconsistent with the godly life. All right, now, John chapter 15, verse 7. It says, if, if, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what who wills? What you will, and it shall be done for who? You. Now, the word abide there is a very interesting word in the Greek. It carries with it the, the overtones or the connotation of this. Abide means to live in, settle down in, and take up residence in. In other words, it means to stay a while. This is not an overnight stop. The word abide means to live in, settle down in, and take up residence in. Now, let's read it like that, and you'll see what an impact it'll make. If ye live in, settle down in, and take up residence in me, and my words live in, settle down in, and take up residence in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done for you of my Father which is in heaven. Now, how can Jesus afford to give us such a master charge, American Express, carte blanche, Bank America, visa? How can he afford to give us that kind of a blank check, if you would, to say, ask what ye will, and it shall be done. The key is, if ye abide in me, and my word abides in you. If you do that, 
You're going to know what the will of God is. You're going to know your covenant rights. You're going to know what has been bought and paid for by the blood of Christ and what rightfully belongs to you. You're going to know what would please the Heavenly Father, and you're also going to know what would displease Him. You'd know what would be harmful and hurtful to you. And what Jesus is saying is that if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will never desire to have something that is inconsistent with the godly life. You'll never desire to have something that will not, that will hurt or harm you. You will not desire anything that would be ungodly. You would only desire that which would be pleasing to the Father, that would be helpful and edifying to you, that would not take away from your witness, would not uh, uh, compromise your testimony concerning Christ. You wouldn't want anything like that, would you? And so Jesus has given you credit for having that kind of commitment to him. And so he can afford to say, ask what you will. He said, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. He said, if ye abide in me, live in, settle down in, take up residence in me, and my word lives in, settles down in, and takes up residence in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done for you of my Father which is in heaven. All right, let's go back to Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Now in Mark eleven twenty four, Jesus said, what thing soever ye desire. So we can see then that having our desires is consistent with God's word and that it is God's plan and purpose that we have the desires of our heart as long as our desires are in line with his word. And I guarantee you, dear friend, that everything in this word is sufficient to meet every need, to meet every desire that would be consistent with a godly life and nothing in it would ever desire or lead you into a desire that would be inconsistent with a godly life. Well, we're not finished yet with this subject of how faith works. Continue to study with us and remember these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. This program is now available to you on compact disc or DVD. CD copies are available for your love gift of any amount. DVD copies are available for your love gift of $15 or more for the ongoing support of this ministry. Call the number on your screen or write to Dr. Frederick K.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90009. Indicate the number you see on your screen. And join us again on the ever-increasing Faith Network, bringing to you the power of faith to transform your life. Welcome to Ever-Increasing Faith. Remember these words, these words, remember these words, how faith works. That's the way it ought to be with your faith. You ought to be just that way with faith so that when the devil comes up to you and tries to bring sickness on you, as soon as you see the sickness, you're like, ah, you ready for it. Huh? That's right. And I tell you what, if the hand that God wants to bless you through closes its fist and won't give it out, I guarantee you God's got another hand. Well, if he wants us to live by faith, he must want us to gain the benefits of living by faith. As far as I was concerned, he hadn't done it. And I was talking in the future. And that's why it never happened. Because that's not faith. Faith is always now. Remember, you have made it happen for the past 35 years. I appreciate your loyalty. Stay with us and enjoy my classic teachings. Call the number on your screen or visit www.faithdome.org to order your copy of the Timeless Message today. Thank you.